Tonight I'll just be talking about gunner Robert Bowie, the 53rd Battery, Australian Field Artillery, and his part in downing the Baron. Bob Bowie was 23 years old when he enlisted on the 27th of October 1916. He was an oyster farmer and a fisherman from Brooklyn in New South Wales. And Brooklyn is now the... Ooh, I'll stand here. <laughs> Brooklyn is now the northernmost suburb in the Sydney metropolitan area, and it's on the shores of the Hawkesbury River. He was allocated to the 1st Pioneer Battalion. He deployed and underwent his training on the Salisbury Plain at Favant. But pioneers weren't to his liking, and he decided and applied and was granted permission to transfer to the field artillery, and he was allocated to 53 Battery. During his training, but he showed some great proficiency with the Lewis light machine gun. Section weapon, magazine drum fed on the top with 48 rounds, 303 calibre and air cooled. A great weapon which was highly manoeuvrable and then operated in an uh, anti-aircraft role. When he was selected to be the anti-aircraft gunner for 53 Battery, he relished the opportunity. He learnt, wanted to know everything he could about it and in fact even developed a, a revolutionary sight which was fitted to the weapon which he used to great effect later on. The fateful day, Sunday the 21st of April 1918. 10.40 hours in the morning, 10.45 in the morning. 53 batteries deployed along the Bray Corby Road and they're in the vicinity of Villas Bretano, the vital strategic town, and the village of Vox to Somme. Part of a larger force. And that force was to provide stability and defence to Villas Bretano and also the vital rail hub that we've already discussed previous at Amiens. But it was the height of the German offensive of March, April and issues were always in doubt. The major players we have. In the air, 2nd Lieutenant Wilfred Wop May, 209th Fighter Squadron, Royal Air Force. A Canadian. Also there was his mate, also a Canadian, and an old school chum, Captain Arthur Roy Brown, Distinguished Service Cross, again with the 209th. The RAAF, had only, sorry, the RAF, I should say, had only just come into being. It was the amalgamation of the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service, and both had been joined in. Brown was already a double ace, 10 victories. He received his Distinguished Service Cross for a previous act of valour. On that day, it was Wilfred May's first operational sortie in a combat zone. And May, uh, sorry, Brown had given him strict orders, do not engage, I want you to stay high and observe and learn. They were flying in the backbone of the Royal Air Force for fighters, and that was the Sodworth Camel. Single seat, biplane, armed with two machine guns. Their adversary on that day, Captain, the cavalry captain, Manfred von Richthofen, of German nobility and the head of the, the famed Flying Circus. He'd scored the previous day his 79th and his 80th victory, and he was destined for more. He had one cardinal rule, that is, never fight over your enemy's front line. It was to fight over your own territory, or at worst, over no man's land. He was flying the highly manoeuvrable Fokker triplane, painted red, hence his name, the Red Baron. On the ground, we have Bob Bowie, armed with his uh, Lewis light machine gun, and adapted for anti-aircraft work on a, uh, a tripod, which was highly manoeuvrable, but it did lack some certain range. Snowy Evans, and unfortunately I don't have a photo of Snow, but Snowy was born here in Queanbeyan. He was a shearer by trade, 25 years old. When war broke out, he was in Huendon in Queensland and enlisted in the 5th Light Horse Regiment as a trooper. He served at Gallipoli with distinction. And after the evacuation, with the expansion of the AIF, he also put his hand up to go to the field artillery. And he had served on all of the major campaigns leading up to 1918. Another player at the ground level was Sergeant Cedric Popkin. He was with the 24th Machine Gun Company. Popkin was armed with the Vickers medium machine gun, 303 calibre, 
water cooled and belt fed. He had a brother who was serving in the British Army. He was to lose that brother about two months after this action. He also had a sister serving uh, as a nurse with the Australian Army Nursing Service. On the day, two RE-8 reconnaissance aircraft belonging to Free Squadron, Australian Flying Corps, were doing a sortie, it was a, a three hour reconnaissance mission over the Allied front line. They would jump by a flight of German aircraft and the start of the dogfight started. Further German aircraft came in to, to assist and the famed Flying Circus. 209 Squadron with Brown and May seen this and 209 Squadron went in to assist the, the, uh, the Australians. May did stay out of the fight but his youthful exuberance let him down and he got into the melee and they started in there and there was 30 aircraft flying around and fighting. May was totally out of his depth. He decided to break contact and go low. He was chased by the Red Baron, intent on making him that 81st victory. Brown seen this and then followed them down. This is a sketch taken out of CWE Bean's um, history of World War I. And basically what happened, we've got Richtofen, his flight path in yellow. We've got May in orange and Brown is in the, the dark purple colour. Brown's come down to do one sweep. He was at a, on a high speed dive, fired on the Red Baron, overshot, and then came back around again. The, the flight ensued. The Red Baron is intent and absolutely focusing on May as opposed to Brown. Brown came in for a second hit. And when he did, the Red Baron then broke and then dove down to the right. And Brown thought that he had actually got a kill. He fought him down the aircraft and immediately broke contact and swung back up to join the fight, the dogfight that was still ensuing at a higher altitude. But, Bra but von Richthofen re-engaged. We then come down and May is flattened out at a range of altitude of 150 feet and they're over the occupied village of Vox le Somme. It is occupied by the Australians who start to engage um, von Richthofen's plane as it comes over the top. They continued on and further up is Popkin providing his anti-aircraft defence with the Vickers gun. As the Baron flew over, Popkin tracked and then fired from, with, on the left hand side of von Richthofen's plane. He put 80 rounds into the aircraft firing from the, the left-hand side and slightly back. Now, 80 rounds seems like a lot, but previous um, seminars have highlighted how hard it is to bring down a canvas and wooden structured plane without hitting something vital. He breaks contact and then they come up against Snowy Evans and Bob Bowie. Snowy is about 30 metres away from Bob and over on the right-hand side. So he's in a better angle to be able to engage the Baron which he does effectively with structures flying off around the cockpit and to the tail end of the plane. Bowie is hindered. He can't fire because May is in his line of fire. So he has to wait until May flies over and then Bowie engages. He puts 48 rounds, a whole pannier, into the aircraft in an oncoming motion. Von Richthofen then breaks contact and does a sweeping right hand turn and almost coming back on to um, following his flight path back out. Popkin fires at extreme range of 600 yards and one burst and that was about it. And that could have been the lucky burst because the Baron then did a loop and then did a forced landing. The depiction over on the left hand side is one of Popkin actually engaging with his Vickers gun. The sight the Bowie would have seen is that top one, the looming plane of the Red Baron coming straight at him. And the Baron did dip his nose in an attempt to try and take Bowie out, who knows. Down the bottom is the sight that was used by Bowie and developed by Bowie. And that was made out of a flattened out piece of brass from an 18 pounder cartridge case. It was fitted to the weapon and used to great effect. And over here is the depiction of Bowie engaging. There was a guy here, Frank Wormold, that you see there. Okay? Frank was a dispatch rider. 
He was two metres away from Bowie and he swears in later testimony that he watched a stream of red hitting the Red Baron in the chest. Bowie agreed with that as well and the forced landing. So this is the area where the, the battle ensued, up around this area here. And I'd walked that area a number of times. The field that he landed in, the Red Baron landed in, was here. All right, just near the brickworks. The ongoings. The wound, wound to the Red Baron was fatal. He, was, he would bleed out in mere minutes. He brought his plane in for an effective, yet bumpy, but basically effective landing. But um, Wormold is already on his way to the crash site and actually seen the plane land and then flip. As he took the Baron out of the cockpit, he did notice that the fuel and the starter switch were both off. Now that's probably good drills for the Baron because he, I think he would rather bleed to death than burn to death. So he's trying to, to push the threat of fire down. He had a fractured jaw, compound fracture of the jaw from hitting the dashboard as the plane crumped in. He had several minor uh, bullet wounds, or sorry, I should say splinter wounds around the facial and the eye areas, but he had his goggles on, so these were non-debilitating non -debil to him. But he did utter the final words, alas kaput, and then died. As Peter has highlighted, this has been an ongoing um, controversy and saga in who actually got the Baron. But what happened was the digger impact. Soldiers from the, uh, the nearby units swarmed to the area, all intent on capturing the pilot. At that point they didn't know it was actually the Baron until they seen the, uh, the uh, red aeroplane and then they just hacked into it. They all after that prized and elusive souvenir. One young digger reached down and seen the signet ring on the Baron's finger tried to pull it off, it wouldn't move. So he took out his pocket knife, intent on taking finger and ring at the same time. He changed his mind after an Australian officer pulled a pistol on him. <laughs> he thought better of it. The aircraft was then moved to um, Free Squadron, Australian Flying Corps air Airfield, um, where some analysis could go on. But as you see, it is absolutely hacked to pieces. Chivalry of the Australians provided a military funeral with full military honours for the Baron. The hot wash of the action. Bowie and Evans were credited by their commanding general, General Rawlinson, with firing the fatal shot. Congratulated in person by General Birdwood weeks later, where Birdwood asked Bowie, would you mind if I had that site as a souvenir? And Bowie gra gratefully gave it to him. It's now in the Australian War Memorial. Only a couple of days after the action, both Bowie and Evans were nominated or recommended for the Meritorious Service Medal. Not for shooting down the Baron, but in fact holding their ground, doing their job, an effective fire which made the Baron disengage and thus saving May. The Royal Air Force and the Flying Fraternity were adamant that Brown should receive the credit, and Brown went on to receive a bar for his Distinguished Service Cross. Bean, CEW Bean, our noted historian, conducted his own investigation and deemed that Popkin delivered the fatal hit. The 14th Field Artillery Brigade, the superior unit to 53, um, has a one-line entry in its uh, brigade war diary for that day. The wound itself. The fatal wound hit underneath the right armpit. It came out just near the left nipple. The projectile was found in the clothing um, intact, but it was then souvenired. The angle depicts that the projectile was definitely fired from the ground, not from the air. Ascertained by putting a piece of fencing wire through the whole round and then judging the angle of the wire on entry and exit. But one of the autopsies had the, the round coming the opposite way. It was put down as a simple um, transcription error. Eyewitnesses, both Bowie and Wormold, stated that they saw a bullet wound in the Baron's chest. And there was another report of that by an Australian pilot who was also examining the body. Independent examinations continue to this day and will continue after everyone in this room is long and gone. But one of the latest theories is it was a low velocity round fired at extreme range, which pushed it towards Popkin yet again. 
now the Bowie family's biggest battle. Bob was hospitalised in 1918 with myocardias, which is a swelling of the muscle around the heart. It's a debilitating disease. He was sent home. He was not granted a full military pension because he, um, it wasn't war-related, even though he was discharged as medically unfit. The onset of the Great Depression hit him hard. He relied on family handouts and whatever stringy vegetables he could actually do. He couldn't actually, wasn't fit enough to go fishing again or earn a wage. He met um, and married a local divorcee, Laurel, and there were three children from that union. Though suffering extremely poor in poor health, he had to go on the road to try and raise funds to feed the family. Ex-soldiers had priority on employment in uh, the Depression, but they had to prove that they had service. But unfortunately, Bob had lost his uh, discharge certificate and thus had to claim another one. But bad luck plagued him for the rest of his life. In 1936, he was living in Paddington and a fire broke out. He lost his discharge certificate yet again at the height of the Depression. He also lost his treasured uh, return from active service badge and his more treasured campaign medals, being the British War Medal and the Victory Medal. Bob requested a replacement from Army, but it was going to cost one pound, 23 shillings and tuppence, which was a fortune in those days and far beyond the reach of Bob Bowie. So no replacement medals. Despite his increasing health issues, he pushed and returned to fishing to try and feed the family. Anzac Day 1964, his final fishing trip. He was going out late afternoon. When he didn't return by nightfall and over the, the, the later night, the family raised a, a quick search party. His son found Dad adrift in the boat, dead at the oars, surrounded by the best catch he'd had in years. On the 28th of April, just mere days after Bob's uh, departure, Laurel is left destitute and she writes to Army and pleads for any information or assistance that Army can give to help feed her family. She also then asked about the Victoria Cross that she was sure that her husband had been awarded for downing the Baron. 23rd of March, 1967, um, Douglas, the, the son, also put in for the medals and was denied. All he wanted to do was march proudly on Anzac Day on behalf of his father, only to find out that the regulations had changed, that only the recipient could ask for the medals, and thus that entitlement died with Bob. March 6, 1973, and his daughter, Bob's daughter, visited Victoria Barrack Sydney to the Public Relations Branch, and for some reason they told her that Bob Bowie had been awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal, second only to the Victoria Cross for other ranks. But again, it was a false expectation and it proved fruitless. But in 2001, there was some good news. A story I'd published had, uh, had been read and the family were able to look at this and put up two honours and awards that if our father asked for the medals back here but couldn't afford them, and now you change the regulations, why can't the original one be honoured? And it was accepted. And it was a proud day, myself and Brigadier Vince, Evan, uh, Vince um, Williams joined the Bowie family at Bob's grave. And on behalf of the Australian artillery and a faithful nation and a grateful nation, we were able to present those medals to the Bowie family, lest we forget. <laughs>